projects, um, maintaining the health of Maasai cattle in the face of Obigana, or East Coast fever, and Endorobo, or animal culture and surmises. Comparison of Maasai Western knowledge. So like Nikki said yesterday, uh, we split our time between the university and the research site near Tarangiri National Park. And when we were in the university, we developed a research proposal and we had the option of either um, doing a research project within the park or conducting interviews with the local pastoralist tribe, the Maasai, in the villages surrounding the park. Um, so as a pre-vet student, I was really torn and I thought there were more animals in the park. But after talking to Laura Higgs, our research assistant, um, she kind of made the connection that if I love cows in America, then I probably will love cows in Tanzania. And as you can see, I did. And so I was able to study the Maasai relationship with their cattle. And for the Maasai, these cattle are really important. They're a source of milk and they're a source of meat. And they're also seen as a sign of wealth. So the more cattle you have, the more wives you can support, the more children. Um, so after we arrived in the field, we were introduced to our translators, and this is a picture of me and my translator and another group member. Um, and without the, the translators, our research would not have been possible. They were translating between two languages, and so it was very difficult. Um, so with Samuel's help, I was able to conduct 14 interviews, 13 with the male Maasai cattle owners, and given that the amount of Given the amount of medicine that the cattle owners reported buying from agri-veterinary shops in the village, I also interviewed a shopkeeper. In addition to that, I was able to observe one of my um, informants medically treat one of his own cows, and I was able to kind of try my hand at herding. Um, so that's me trying my hand at herding and leading the cattle up to go for the day. Um, after we arrived back in Dar, I was able to compile all my data and look at the Western perspective of things. Um, so I interviewed 13 respondents, and I found that, well, 14 diseases were discussed during those interviews, but it's really hard to do a research project of 14 different diseases, so mm -hmm. I chose the two most prevalent ones, Obigana and Endorobo. And when we got back in Dar, we had a lot more access to internet, so I was able to um, research the Western side of the symptoms and the causes and the treatments and compare those to the um, symptoms and the causes of the treatments that I had learned from the moth side. So here's what I found. Um, these are the symptoms. And just as a note, these tables are kind of arranged in order of frequency. So this is highest frequency. Um, and 13 out of 13 means that 13 out of my 13 informants um, discussed swollen throat glands as a symptom of East Coast fever. So the differences that I found in this, um, just as an aside, the, because they're using so much Western medicine, it's really important to kind of go into why there are differences and what those differences are and how can we make these differences not be as detrimentally effective to the health of their cattle. Um, so the differences that I found in the symptoms were that there is a language barrier, obviously. Mm -hmm. And so, parotid lymph node, which refers to a lymph node right below your ears. I'm guessing my translator did not have this in vocabulary, so instead he probably went with the swollen throat glands. Um, in addition, stifle, kind of the same thing. It's in the hip region, probably referred to swollen throat glands. Um, also, another difference was the varying access to medical instruments. So in the Western world, they have access to thermometers and instruments to um, kind of diagnose anemia. Whereas in the Maasai world, they don't have that. So they diagnose symptoms with more physical attributes. Um, for the causes, the East Coast fever, it's interesting because it takes, they're pretty much split between the two, even in the Maasai. And then when I went to the Western literature, I was able to find out why. So these brown ear ticks that actually transmit the parasite that infects the cattle, um, they live in a habitat that's tree covered, that's humid, that's grassy, which is basically consistent with the river basin, given that everything else is pretty dry. Um, so that's, and given that 90% of the time that the tick 
The tick spends 90% of its time in its preferred environment instead of on the host of the cattle. So, instead of on its host. So, it's easy to see why they would think it belongs to the grasses than on the ticks. Um, Endopinosomiasis is pretty similar. And this is not surprising given that in ma, endorobo actually means sets of fire. Um, for the treatments, they were generally the same because they used so much Western medicine. Um, the main differences that I observed were that in East Coast fever, they do use traditional medicine, but only as a supplementary technique. Um, also, blue carbicone in the Western literature um, is specifically targeted to the parasite that causes East Coast fever. So, having oxytetracycline, which is a broad spectrum antibacterial drug on hand, is a lot more effective for the moth side to have than just having this one specific drug. Um, unfortunately, the widespread use of oxytetracycline and the widespread use of the treatments for dependosomiasis are leading to drug resistance. So given that the Maasai had begun to heavily, heavily implement Western medicine into their treatment methods, minimizing any discrepancies between the Maasai and the Western perspectives is necessary to maximize the health of the Maasai cattle. So I didn't really find a silver, silver bullet to kind of solve all of these problems, but uh, concluded that if they have the time and the communication and the cooperation within the Tanzanian culture as a whole, um, access to educational resources will be provided. In addition, I found from interviewing the shopkeeper that they sell amidin-based insecticides and peripheral-based insecticides in their shops. And amidin-based insecticides are only targeting ticks, while peripheral-based insecticides are targeting ticks and tsetse flies. So in a tick and tsetse fly infected area, like Tanzania, it really doesn't make sense to be selling amidin-based insecticides as a only targeting one of the main factors. <coughs> so with the implementation of these proposed actions, I hope that the health and the well-being of the Maasai cattle and the Maasai people will be increased. And thank you for your time, and these are the people and the animals I would like to thank. <laughs> <laughs>